Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. So today we're here with my friend Jody, and we're going to talk a little bit about your background in business. And um, we have an audience of a lot of aspiring six-figure earners and others that are in six figures, but you're so interesting because you have this amazing business background. So you have two masters Mm -hmm. in business and accounting. Yep. And you went into real estate and you've been wildly successful in real estate, which is something that I think a lot of people in general, but women, um, a lot of women try to take that route, right? Yeah. So will you talk a little bit about that transition? You're also a mom of three children and you just had your first grandbaby, (laughs) which is so sweet. Talk a little bit about that transition from being in, you know, a traditional kind of business role to owning your own business in real estate and how that happened for you. So how it happened was I, I lost my job. So that was, it was a, you know, I went into accounting thinking that was going to be my career and went into public accounting before I moved to Boise and then got into corporate accounting and thought this is my career for the rest of my life. I wasn't really happy, but I was good at it. Mm-hmm. So I became a manager at a big corporation here in town and thought this was my life. And my position was, it was gone all of a sudden and I didn't have anywhere to go. And I, I kind of fell into a hole for a little while. And I was sitting on a soccer field and got offered a position with a, with a builder here in town from a friend. He said, you should come sell houses for me. And I kind of laughed at him and didn't think it was something I would realistically do. And I sat on it for a couple of weeks and told my husband, I think I'm going to go to real estate school and see what I can do. And he 100% supported me and said, let's do it. And so that's how it started. Don't you, don't you look back at that now, though? I think um, so many of us, when something significant happens in our life and there's this major change that's like thrust upon us, really, mm-hmm. it's not something that we choose. A lot of times we look back and we think, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Absolutely. I, and I've said that daily since I've started this job. It, it's not a really a job for me. It's a passion that I love and I love helping people find a home. I love helping people build a home. I love doing the design for homes. So all of that, plus meeting all of these different people and having my day-to-day work not be monotonous, mm-hmm. just became something that I get up in the morning and I love starting to work. And I didn't feel that for 23 years. I didn't get up in the morning and go, oh, I get to go to work today. You know, and now I get up and think, oh, I get to go to work today. And it's a completely different thought process for me. And it's so true as someone that has interacted with you in that environment, um, you feel your passion like you really you're just so alive in it um, and you're a joy to work with. And I think that it's interesting because. Um, you can really feel when someone has a passion for something. They they come across differently. Their energy is different, right? Do you think that when you first started in real estate, you were that way? Or is it something that happened over time for you? Um, when I first started, it was such an unknown because mm-hmm. in my 20s, before I had kids, that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And um, it was back before computers, and so it was a big book of looking through houses and trying to figure out things. And so back then, I was terrified. Mm-hmm. And when I started it this time, there were so many tools that made it so automated and so easy to help people mm-hmm. that it just became a cycle for me that wasn't difficult. I, it came easy. School came easy for me, but it was because I was passionate about it. I wanted to learn what was happening. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't a school person. I struggled to get through school. It, it was really a chore to do my degrees that I was in, especially because I did it with small children. So there was a lot involved with that. Mm-hmm. My husband and I did school together, and we started school at 9 o'clock at night. And oh we gosh. studied all through the evening, probably until two or three in the morning, we'd sleep for a couple hours, get up, get the kids ready for daycare or for kindergarten or whatever. And we would repeat that six days a week was basically our lives for three years together. 
So such an interesting thing for me because um, I've interviewed so many women and one of the things that always comes out in these interviews is work ethic. And what you're talking about is an insane (laughs) work ethic, right? I mean, really, if you think back to it, there is not a lot of people that would do that. Yeah. And I feel like you have definitely applied that to your real estate business because like I never have question or when I've interacted with you in that business realm, it's always like right there on the... So talk a little bit about that because I think that, again, there's a lot of listeners that are thinking, oh, I I would love to be in real estate. Real estate would be great for me. Or maybe they're in real estate and they're just starting out in that profession or they've been there for a little while and they're maybe not having the success that you do. What advice would you give someone that is just getting started in real estate? It's truly not about buying a house or selling a house. That's the biggest thing is I I think one of the things I pride myself on the most is meeting that person and talking to that person and figuring out where they want to be for a home mm-hmm. and what they want that home for. There's different reasons for the house, you know. Our interaction together is different because of what you wanted those homes for mm-hmm. than what it's going to be if we look for a home for you personally, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think there's a lot involved with that. I listen to them and try to figure out what they want and why they want it. Mm -hmm. And then I find the house for them. I very rarely, the majority of the conversations that I have with the people that I interact with to help them is about the house. It's more about them. And I think that that's where a lot of newer agents think that, oh, I can put a cell sign in in the yard or I can take them to view a house and I write up a piece of paper and there's so much more involved if you really want it to be successful and have people come back to you, Mm -hmm. you know, or refer you or whatever the case may be. Yeah, that listening piece is huge, right? I think in any area of business, not just what you do, but in a lot of business, it's that listening piece. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes people are so anxious for the sale or for the business or for whatever it is that it's it's less about stepping back and listening to the other person and it's more about almost like a sale, so to right. speak, right? Right, yeah. it is, it, it can come and you can feel it. I've dealt with other agents that they just are ready for a paycheck mm-hmm. and it's scary because you're on commission only for the most part, mm-hmm. unless you're working for a builder. Some of them have a base plus commission or whatever the case may be. But if you are really going into a general brokerage position, your livelihood depends on if you get that sale. And so it can be very nerve wracking. And so you have to really know that you're dedicating yourself to that and that you have the resources to be able to do what you want to do. You know, so it it does make it a little terrifying. When I first took the leap, it took me three years and I had a great lady that stepped in and said, I had an interaction with her when I was working for a builder and she called me out of the blue and said, I loved the fact that you, on my day off, she called and needed to get into one of the houses. And I went over during the middle of my soccer game. My kid was having a soccer game and I took time off and said, I can run over and unlock the house for you. There isn't a lockbox on it. And I went over looking like a soccer mom. I didn't look professional. (laughs) I didn't, you know, baseball cap and all. And, um, but I had a great conversation with her and asked her what her clients needed. And then I just followed up with her after that. And she was shocked that I was getting a salary. I I wasn't getting a commission. And Mm. so she was shocked that I went out of my way. It wasn't costing me anything, you know. And she offered to be my partner. And she taught me a lot about general brokerage. And then when we decided to break up and do our own things, she taught me so much. So I dedicate a lot of my success now to what she taught me when I stepped out. It's so interesting. Again, that's another like piece that comes in, I think, with so many women is the mentorship piece, the people around you that you're able to learn from and ask questions of. But you brought up something that I want to dive into a little bit, which is you have been an amazing mom and a working mom and a very successful working mom. And so let's talk about that because there's there are so many women that really struggle with I want a career, but I want to be a good mom. But I want, it's almost like they feel like there has to be an either or. And you did both very successfully. Mm-hmm. And I keep saying this, but, and now you have your first grandbaby. Like, <laughs> it's such a cool thing to me. So, so talk about how you navigated that and, and the struggles that you had in that. What did that look like for you? Well, 
when my girls were little, I was a single mom. So there was a lot of things going on there that, you know, I mean, I didn't make a lot of money. I was actually on welfare. We did a lot of things that now looking back really got me to push myself to get to where I am now, mm -hmm. you know? So going through all those trials and figuring that part out was difficult mm -hmm. and being able to tell my kids, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't do that today. We don't have the money or I, I couldn't have my girls' birthday parties when they were little. We went to McDonald's for their birthday parties, you know? So totally different scheme of where we are today, you know? So there was a lot involved in that, but I think it helped my girls understand where they're at now. So that helped me decide when I finally found somebody that would support me to gain the knowledge and get a college degree and do all of those things that I couldn't do as a single mom. So I worked really hard at it. And at the time I was good at accounting. I had an accounting background. I could manage all of that and do the schooling. And so that's why I decided to go that direction and didn't really think about the dream job or a job I would love to wake up for, but it paid my bills, mm -hmm. you know? So that was the direction that I went. But that's where so many people are. Yeah. I mean, and I think just um, just being able to get to the point where you can provide and then maybe dream a little bit. And then you're thrown into a position where now your position is elim eliminated and you end up really in an entrepreneurial role, right? Yeah. So will you talk a little bit about that? Because there's... There's a really big difference, I feel like, between being a corporate employee and being your own boss. Oh, for sure. And and it's a different skill set in a lot of ways because you have to get up and work. Yeah. <laughs> right? And you don't have somebody telling you to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was that transition for you? You know, I think I've been harder on myself as a boss than my managers were. And I always tease my family. I'm like, you know, my boss is really mean. She won't let me off today. But that's kind of <laughs> what it is. I mean, you have to take you have to take that time and figure out how to balance. And I struggled. I mean, my first year and a half probably doing things on my own, I really focused on just my career. And I put a lot of the things that I should have been doing with my family to the side. And I thought, oh, my son's old enough. It's okay. My girls are out of the house. It doesn't really matter. And I didn't really recognize some of the things that I was letting go that mm -hmm. I should have really been holding on to. So, And what are those? Maybe. So if, if, if there was one of the things that I love about these conversations is that they're so open. And what I hope is that there are women that are listening that are like, oh, that's that's something for me to really pay attention to as I go on this journey. Right? Yeah. So, for instance, I, we went on vacation this summer and it was the first time I'd taken a week off. Well, I took my computer with me and my husband was praying there wouldn't be Wi-Fi. Well, there was. <laughs> and I'm, we're on a kayak. We're kayaking down the river. It's beautiful. And I was on the phone, on my laptop, doing my work. And the whole time my son kept saying in the background just little snide remarks about I wasn't enjoying our vacation and why couldn't I take some time off. And finally it hit me about three days into our vacation that I needed to hang up the phone and let the people that support me in my job do their jobs job. so that I could take a vacation. Yeah. But it took a really... It took me about three days of our vacation to really understand that this was supposed to be for my family. It was I had the money to go. I just couldn't let go. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have a control issue. I know that. I want <laughs> I was everything say, to be. Do you think maybe there's a <laughs> just, control issue just there? Just a little bit. There's just a little bit. But I think to be successful, you have to have some control for that, right? I agree. Um, but I, I finally just said, you know what? It'll be fine. If things fall apart, somebody will give me a call. And so finally, I just let it go. And I came back and everything was fine. But it took it took a little while to do that, you know. <laughs> but my clients never knew I was on vacation. They had no idea where I was and what I was doing. But maybe I should have told them so they would have quit calling me, you know. So <laughs> there was a lot of balancing I wasn't doing very well. And I learned my lesson. And so now I, at 7 o'clock at night, typically, unless it's an emergency, I shut off my phone. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to die between 7 a, it, at night to 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. It's all going to be fine. So I had to figure that out. It so took you a bit. some boundaries in. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, we're in this position as you and I have very nice lives, right? And there is a lot of... Um, women that are aspiring to six figures. Do you remember when you hit that mark? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. It was pretty crazy because my husband was always the one that made enough money to support us, you know. And I think I realized when we built our new house that we're in now and I was able to support because I, I have my mom and my brother with me. My mm -hmm. brother's disabled and I took guardianship of him. And the goal was to build a house that we could all live in together. And when we finally got to the point that I could do that and I was repaying my parents for taking care of me, it I really looked back and thought, oh my gosh, I mean, we've come, I've come full circle. I've finally listened to everything that my parents told me and I've worked hard to get to where they were. And now I'm taking care of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was, I'm really proud of where I've gotten to be. Mm -hmm. It's it's a pretty big deal to wake up in the morning and go, I'm supporting my mom and she's living in this beautiful home and it's because of our hard work, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I wouldn't have gotten there without my husband saying, you can do it. Just tell me what we need to do. You know? Such a cool thing, right? Yeah. And such an amazing example for all of your children, but your daughters in particular. I feel like as daughters, they really watch us oh. as their moms, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So if you were going to talk to a brand new young realtor and give them those one or two pieces of advice, what would that be? I think to really look at your lifestyle and see if it's a, something that you want to do. I think right now with the market, there's a lot of young people coming out and deciding that they want to do this because they think it's an easy, mm -hmm. it's an easy job. But if you have young children and you have all of the, you have to figure out the balance yeah. of what you want to do. And you can be successful, but you really have to throw yourself into the job for a little bit, I think. And it doesn't mean that you put your family on the back burner, but you really have to be dedicated and do the phone calls and, and really carve out some time that that's all you do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I didn't do it when I was a young mom. But I think for young women now starting out, they could do it. They just need to know that it's it's not easy. It's not an easy dollar. It, you don't get a paycheck easily. It's not just about the pretty bells and whistles. It truly is a lot of hard work. It's so interesting to me because I talk to women in so many different, um, you know, industries and radically different, some of them. But so many of the pieces of wisdom are exactly the same. It doesn't matter the industry. And um, I had been interviewing someone else that said, it's the hard work that you put on early in. <laughs> like, almost exactly the same thing that you just said in radically, radically different industry, right? So I think that they hold true in so many pieces. So you were in a profession that you were very good at and you lost that job. Mm -hmm. And that, that can shake you emotionally. How, how did you handle that? What was that like? Did you go into depression? Are you the person that got angry? What, what happened for you in that? I think I had all sorts of emotions, honestly. When I left my office that day, I was very angry. There was a lot of anger involved because it was such a surprise. You know, I actually thought that I was coming into a meeting with some of the heads of my office, and I was actually walking into a meeting with the head of HR and my, ma and my direct manager. So that was a surprise. And it wasn't anything. There was no whisperings. I had no idea it was going to happen. And it, sometimes you have a feeling. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. So there was, you know, there was that. It was the shock and the anger. And I was in the office at 830 and I was out of the office by 915, you know. Um, so that was, I sat on that for a couple of days. And then um, I couldn't make myself do anything. I wasn't motivated to do anything at all. I didn't look for jobs. I didn't make phone calls. I didn't tell anybody. The only person that knew was my husband and my kids that I wasn't going to work. And my kids didn't even really understand what was happening. I didn't tell them that I'd lost my job because I was embarrassed. I told them that I was just staying home for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, but pretty soon I just, I, kind of like when I have a cold, I just figure out how to work it out of me. I don't like to be sick and laying down. And finally I was like, I'm done. I've got to figure something out. And so I just started to get out and I told my husband, I'm not looking for a job right now. And he said, that's okay. Do what you need to do. And so we went through it. And then I started to look and I started to apply for other accounting positions. I got tons of interviews. I got several job offers and I turned them all down. And I couldn't figure out why I was turning them down. I needed a paycheck or I thought I needed a paycheck. Um, and then I just my friend just approached me sitting on the soccer field on the sidelines watching our sons play soccer. And he said, 
what are you going to do? And I said, I really don't know. And he was the one that said, I think you'd be good at it. You should try it. But it took a really long time for me to look at myself and go, I think I could do that. You know, I went through all sorts of depression and just sitting on the couch watching TV. My husband would come home from work. I was still in my pajamas, sitting in my chair. You know, I would clean my house and that was about it. So it, it took a little bit to get myself over that. And I think everybody goes through those stages a little bit differently. There's some mourning involved and, you know, you don't see the people at your office anymore and all of those things. So it almost sounds like a grieving process that you went through. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it was. There was a lot of different things, you know, and then finally telling my family, all of my family, that I had lost my job and that I was looking for something new and didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. There was a lot of that involved, you know. Um, but then when I got into real estate school, all of a sudden I just woke up. It just, I was excited to go to school, which that was honestly the first time in my life I can tell you that I was excited to go to school. I was not a student, you know, but I was really good in it. I would go in and the topics were interesting. The things I was learning were interesting. And so it really brought a new light into what I was doing. Did your family question you a lot in going in, in, in really a completely different direction? I know your husband was supportive, but the rest of your family, I find a lot of times you're, the people that are closest to you, they want to protect you really right. is what it is, but it doesn't always come across that way <laughs> at the time, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think they would have questioned me more if I didn't have a job offer waiting for me to get my mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. So there was, I had to get my license in order to start my new job. Yeah. And so they didn't really question a lot of that. They just said, you know, well, do well in school and right. <laughs> keep yourself going. And, and they just stood back in the background, you know, and, and patted me on the back occasionally and asked me if I was doing okay. But other than that, they didn't really question the decision. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I had a husband that had a decent enough career at the time that he could support us while I was doing what I was doing. So that helped. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my parents have always been very, very supportive of everything that I do. So they didn't, it wasn't a huge leap, but a completely different direction. Yeah, that's so. nice. So I would say that there's a lot of people that don't have that kind of support. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question that's very um, specific to the time that we're in right now. So with COVID happening, there's a lot of people that have lost positions. Some of them, it might be temporary. Some of them, it might be permanent. Because you have gone through that, you know, job loss, what kind of advice would you give to someone that's in that phase right now? No, I think part of it is to look at your personal situation. If you have to have a job, then there's so many opportunities still here in the Valley. We live in, we're very blessed here in the Valley with opportunities for growth and opportunities for work. And it may not be the position you want, but can it get you to where you want to be in the end, I think is something that everybody has to look at. Um, I, th I think me personally, I, I have this little person in the back of my head that says, there's always a job out there. It might not be perfect, but take it until you can find the job you want. And I think that that's what I did for 23 years. I took the job that I had mm -hmm. until I found the job that I want. And I think that's good advice for people that are national because we do have a lot of people that are watching this podcast that are not, you know, in the same area as you physically. But I think nationally even, um, I've definitely seen that to be true. Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. Right. right. Yeah. And now, I mean, I think corporations have changed their way of thinking too because I think they've discovered that you can work remotely so much easier, which also brings more opportunity. Yeah. If, if there's an opportunity that you could work from home or work at an office part-time and then work from home, you have such a wider bandwidth mm -hmm. than you had with just going to the office eight to five, you know? Yeah. And so it does bring a lot more opportunity to people. There's customer service positions if they want to start at a place like that, that they could work from home. Um, so I just think that there's a lot of education involved with doing things like that, that if you, if you give yourself the opportunity, you can find almost anything. Yeah. Again, back to that work ethic, probably. Right. right. Yeah. So you seem to have this amazing internal drive, right? Just, it's almost like, I don't know, I'm going to do it no matter what, or get out of my way. I'm going to figure out a way kind of, um, where do you think that comes from? Um, growing up, my parents owned a business. They owned a small grocery store. And um, so I grew up 
thinking that I was going to be a grocery store owner. That was that was the plan. Honestly, my brother and I were going to own this store when we were adults. My parents wanted to step back. And um, we were in Chubbuck, a small town in southeastern Idaho, and Smith's Food King built right across the street. Mm-hmm. It bankrupted my parents. And my par- I watched them struggle and struggle until we finally had to close the doors on the store. And it was amazing. We, I, I, My mom and I were just talking about this driving down the street after buying Christmas pe- presents for a family that I adopted this year to give their kids a, a Christmas. And I said, it's amazing to me that I can buy all of this for a family that I don't even own. And then I go to the store down the hallway and buy a pair of tennis shoes for my son that cost as much as the bags full of clothes that I just bought for this entire family. And my parents did that same thing. You know, they were always giving. They were always letting people come in that they knew didn't have the money, get groceries, and they would just sign on a little card how much they owed my parents for the groceries that week. And I think what comes around goes around. And so they taught me that no matter what, you can just pick yourself back up and figure out how to reinvent yourself, for lack of a better term. My dad went to work for INEL after the store closed, and my mom started work for Albertsons. And, you know, they, we thrived again, but we had a couple of years of really hard not having everything at our disposal, Mm -hmm. you know. So I learned that you just do it. You just figure out how to pick yourself back up and reinvent yourself and, you know. they modeled it for you. They did. Yeah. And also they modeled giving, which is an amazing thing. Yeah, 100%. They, I mean, I'm adopted, so they gave to me and gave me a life that I wouldn't have had without them. So, you know, I just, I try to pay that forward to everybody that I meet because I wouldn't be where I'm at without the things that they taught me or bringing me on to their family, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's just, I feel like I got given a huge gift. So that's like a whole podcast in and of itself. (laughs) Right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, this is kind of a funny question, but if you, do you have a book, a podcast, something that for you when you're talking to someone that's a younger, aspiring person, you always say, oh, this one was really good. You should read this. <laughs> or this podcast is really great. You should listen to this. You know, because I'm kind of on the spot, I can't think of one off the top of my head. But I always like to read like little inspirational quotes. I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I can't name a particular author. But I think a lot of it is just remembering that you're good enough, Mm -hmm. that there's things about you that are good enough to step out of your comfort zone. Sort of like today, you know, I mean, it's just putting yourself out there and just announcing that you can help people. And I think Figuring out for me, one of the biggest things for me was when people challenge me and it's somebody looking for a smaller house or at a lower amount or whatever the case may be, if they can tell me what it is that they're looking for, I will bend over backwards to find it. But you have to want to figure out that challenge. And I love a challenge. So I'm I'm always up to help help whoever and whatever find what they need. So that's it. That's part of what makes you successful is if you can step out of those comfort zones a little bit, I think. Yeah, that I always um, I always look at it and say be bold because I feel like when we are challenged or when we're kind of getting out of our comfort zone, you have to be bold in order to make your comfort zone expand, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. and that takes a lot, you know, when you're changing careers or when you're mm-hmm. starting in a career. I think real estate is a lot about being able to talk to people, mm-hmm. and so I... I don't know if I've always been good at that, but when I got into real estate and I loved it so much, the conversation came much easier to me than talking about just frivolous topics, you know? And so that helped me become more of a networker, for lack of a better term. And it it really did help me put myself out there to people and, and start to make phone calls and say, what can I do? How can I help you? You know, and it's opened up a lot of doors for me. So... Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. In closing, anything just off the top of your head, anything I didn't ask you that you would say, oh, this is a, this is like a nugget that I would share with people. You know, I think no matter what career you decide to go into, I think it's just really important to figure out that you love it. I've always advised my girls, don't do what I did. Don't find your career at 43. <laughs> you know, um, it took me a long time. 
to find the place that I wanted to be. And it was when my kids were adults and when they'd figured out things for, you know, they were easy, I guess. Well, they're not easy, but you know what I mean. (laughs) But don't do that. I want them to find something they're passionate about off the top and be able to love what they do when they wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Or change if you're in one that doesn't fit, right? I think a lot of, especially women, I think, they have that fear, oh, but I have a solid income. Yeah, but if you don't love it, you can change, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, and money's just money. It'll it'll keep coming, mm-hmm. you know? So just find something that you love. It makes your life so much happier. That's the important part. That's so true. So. That's great wisdom. Thank you for your time. Thank today. you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com.